So, you want to teach online. Uh, Jennifer, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, I'm Jennifer Quinlan. I'm an academic product consultant at Brigham Young University. I work with our world language courses and all of our online university coursework. Previously, I was um, an instructor for French, both online and in the classroom, and an instructional designer, and I'm currently wrapping up my PhD in second language acquisition. And I'm Catherine Murphy Judy. I'm a professor of French at Virginia Commonwealth University. I've been teaching online and blended since probably about 1998. I created and taught an entirely basic online French program first and second year from 2010 to 2012. Um, I helped co-create the Bold Collaboratory, where a lot of these materials are going to be coming from. And um, I've taken some online courses. Same. And I think Catherine and I can probably both speak to how much variance you can get when you have online courses. And today, we'll talk a little bit about just getting into that mindset. So what we're covering in this module today is context technology and media, our learners, and then we'll wrap it all up and put a pretty bow on the end. So let's start with what you'll learn today. By the end of this module, you should be able to name the online language stakeholders in your institution and identify how to get support. You should be able to start outlining the big picture of your course, identifying the technologies and platforms that you might incorporate, Consider how to select and articulate the content that you use in your course and anticipate the types of learners that you'll have in your course. Catherine's going to get us started thinking about context. So our first question here, what is your context? All right, so we're going to talk today about what is your context. Look at a few things you need to ponder before you dive into the online language teaching uh, situation and look at some of your institutional parameters. First of all, though, I want to talk to you about the national context of online language education. There have been a couple of national surveys. I run one of them. It's the Basic Online Language Design and Delivery Consortium's um, survey, and there have been a couple of others on general online education. But what we know is that online learning is a growing and expanding field, and I can say that it's growing and expanding in languages as well. Most of the courses that are taught online are ones that have been initiated by the faculty themselves. Unfortunately, a lot of the designers and the faculty are not terribly well prepared. We're hoping to do some things to make that no longer the case. And the last bit of important information is that the time frame for creating an entire online course may be as little as three to six months and that's pretty common. We'll look at this again in a minute. So some of the broad stroke considerations that we're going to look at are you, your time, training, your institution, support that you have, and your students. So let's start with you. Why are you or will you be teaching online? It's a really important question that you and your mentor will probably follow up on. It's important to know what's motivating you personally to tackle online language teaching and learning rather than doing uh, maybe a blended or maybe a completely face-to-face. -face. Why are you going into this online? What's the whole thing with using technologies to teach? How do you see yourself as an online instructor? Kind of a good idea to see how you think you're going to be, what, what you think your online learners are going to be seeing from you as an online instructor. You need to look at your personal and family time factors. If you've got children, if you've got a spouse, if you've got parents that you're taking care of, if there are pets who happen to like to be around you a lot, if you're going to be traveling and expect to be doing your online teaching uh, while you're traveling, if you've got other jobs and responsibilities that you'll be juggling, you need to take a look at all of this as you're seeing yourself as an online instructor. 
um, do you realize that online language teaching often takes a lot more time and a lot more commitment than a face-to-face -face course? And finally, how detail-oriented are you? Because the devil is in the details in online language learning. So let's take a look at your preparations. Some more questions for you. Have you ever taken an online course? Before you teach online, you should have taken one, actually more than one, online courses just to see what it's like on the other side of the table or the other side of the screen. Is your institution going to offer you some general coursework on online teaching, something like Quality Matters? Are you going to have support and training from the IT professionals at your institution? Are you going to get specialized training in online language teaching? Because we are special. We do a lot more kinds of online teaching and learning things that the other disciplines often don't have to do. We're special. <laughs> you, right, I hear you, Jennifer. You're, you're agreeing with that one. I mean, we do it all, listening, speaking, reading, writing. It's, it's a, we, we establish communities. It's all really important for us. And importantly, will your access to professional development, because it is to be hoped that you're going to get more professional development for online language teaching, is this going to be ongoing? Are they just going to give you something in the beginning and let it go? No, it needs to be ongoing. And it should be, over time, based on data that's coming out of your real class. So let's take a look at timing. What's the time frame that your institution is planning to allot you for preparing and delivering this course. Again, back to the bold survey, a majority of us are given a summer, uh, maybe a semester, three to six months at most, to create an entire online course and to be all ready to deliver it. Not a lot of time, but you need to find out what's being expected of you. What are the other time factors for your course delivery? Is this something that's going to be in a given semester or term? Or maybe you're going to have a longer period of time for the delivery, maybe shorter. Maybe your regular courses are 16 weeks, but you're only going to have 12 weeks for the online. You need to know what that time period is. And in some institutions, with their online courses, there's a rolling start and a rolling finish date. That there are different people starting at different times. Maybe there are different cohort cohorts that roll in and roll out. Uh, this is pretty often with some of the self-paced kind of remedial models as well. So now we've got four slides that are institutional parameters. This is the first one. We're looking at your institution and where you fit in there. First of all, what kind of program or course is your institution expecting you to create or teach? Is this supposed to be something truly innovative? Um, or is this something that's more articulated with the regular curriculum? Uh, students from the face-to-face -face need to be able to come into online and then move back into face-to-face. -face. What's the articulation with the regular curriculum? Or Maybe your course is supposed to be an add-on, some kind of supplemental learning. It could be developmental or special education, a bridging course, uh, something for students who they've got gaps and, and these what you're going to be providing are gap fillers. Maybe you're offering your course on one campus, but it's being delivered to several campuses. You need to figure out who's in the mix here. Maybe there are learning, learner cohorts, or maybe it's just random groups of students. Is this an independent study? Is it self-paced? They're all questions that you need to find the answers to before you launch into your designing and delivery. Now, how much does the institution or your department, what do they see as your class size? There's one place that's got upwards of 100 students, and there are other places that only allow 12 or fewer students. You really need to know what class size is being expected. Um, 
are there going to be synchronous interactions? And Jennifer is going to get a lot more into the synchronous and asynchronous. But it may be that you have a requirement um, for asynchronous learning because you have people who are contractually your online students who are in government industry or in particular the military. What kind of testing? do you have to have? Is it going to be proctored? Um, is it, are there stipulations at your university about the kinds of testing? You need to see how your institution is planning to support you and also how they're planning on supporting the online students. Second facet of the institutional parameters, what kinds and amounts of institutional support are you going to have? Is this going to be from the top down? Is the upper administration making sure that you've got this? Is this bottom up where you and other faculty have to go and say, hey, we have to have this? What kind of funding are you going to have? Is this coming from the top down or are you supposed to generate uh, through student tuition the funding for your program? The training. Is that being offered to you or do you have to go out and seek it yourself? The IT support, again, is this being offered to you? Are you being put into an IT community of practice that you can really work with? Or do you have to go out and find the people who are going to help you uh, with uh, all kinds of things with your equipment, with students equipment, with the software? What kind of student support services are being offered? There might be other things, but the important thing is who are your go-to people? You need to know who those people are. Third part of the institutional parameters, how supportive are your colleagues? <laughs> There are a lot of colleagues in different language programs who think that it is not possible to teach languages and particularly not the basic first and second year languages online. I'm telling you it is. We have a lot of people doing it and doing it very successfully. But if you've got your colleagues who don't think it's possible, you need to recognize that because either you need to get them on board with you, you probably will have to show them that it's working, but you need to know how supportive they are and how supportive are your supervisors. There are uh, some places where the upper administration really, really, really wants the online, but the departmental chairs don't want it, don't like it, and can possibly cause you problems. You need to figure out who's supportive. And finally, the upper administration, either they're pro or they're con, but you need to know where they are. And if they're really supporting you, uh, ask them to put their money where their mouth is <laughs> and their professional development. <laughs> so uh, another thing about your institutional parameters, what's who and what is around you, are you going to need to interface with your language lab? There are some courses where um, you just do this at home and you're the one who has to make sure that you've got the high speed internet, but there are others where it's through the language lab. Maybe there are other technology facilities that, that are offered or will be offered or that are expected. Are you going to have to create this course or is there a course already there? Are you just going to teach it, not that just teaching online is any kind of just, but um, if you have to create it, this is a whole different ball of wax. Um, now, if you're going to teach the course, you need to also know what kinds of things you can do uh, when you're getting feedback from your learners about changing the course. Got to figure that out ahead of time. Now, if this is a course that you create or it's a course that you oversee, who are the other people who may be teaching this course? Are they going to be adjuncts? Are they going to be teaching assistants or graduate assistants? Maybe you're going to have outside contractors who take your course and deliver it. Um, it's really important to know who will be teaching the course that you develop or if you're going to be teaching the course, who are the people who developed it for you? And 
Do the students want this online language course? You need to find out if the students are behind this and if they're interested and what their fears and so on. We'll talk some more about the, the learners in a bit though. And finally, looking at institutional parameters, are there any professional benefits or rewards? If you design the course, what are you gonna get for it? If you're teaching and administering the course, what's the benefit to you? How is this valued in your academic community? For evaluating, revising, and updating the courses, are you going to be recognized for doing this kind of work? Is it going to be valued? Are you going to see it on your annual report? And it's going to be given the just do that it should have. And are you going to do research on the field? And if you do research on the field, is it going to be valued? It's all about the value. Um, and you need to know where your institution, your department, your colleagues stand uh, when it comes to the valuing of this online program. So, Jennifer. Okay, that was a great overview of just some of the contextual issues. You can see that there are a lot of questions to think of as you start dipping your toe in this pool. Well, we're going to keep pushing you further and further into the pool. Let's talk a little bit about technology and content considerations three key elements we want to cover here, technology and media, your delivery methods, and then creating and using content. So when you think of technology and media, probably the number one question that needs to be answered is how will you host your course? A lot of institutions use a learning management system, but it might be other things too. It might be a Google site, it might be um, a wiki, or some other platform, but find out what your institution, maybe they have something that they require everyone to use for online learning, or maybe they already have licenses to some of these um, hosting platforms. So do that homework first, and then find out whatever hosting platform you're going to use, how does that interact with your student information system? Will grades push automatically, for example? Or are you going to have to manually enter what they did out here in the course over into the um, SIS. I wanna just give you a snapshot here of some app examples of LMS interfaces. Now these are four different LMSs. One's a wiki, we've got Canvas, we've got a few different things here, but you can see some similarities. A left-hand navigation, right-hand tends to be the content. You see um, that an LMS can really facilitate your course organization. It creates a predictable format for students which can really decrease the cognitive load. When they don't have to figure out where they're going or why in the course, that's a good thing. Um, you can see some links that take students to significant points of interest in the course. Assignments, the agenda, upcoming events, the grade book, things like that. So how will you interact with your students? When you're thinking about the technology and media elements of your course, of course in a classroom, you're interacting with your students face to face. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about your teacher presence in a future module, but for now, let's just think of um, your interaction as an element to consider. You might have an online classroom or webinars. You might use the tools within your LMS. Um, you might use external communication tools. Likewise, we'll talk in a future module about how to capture evidence of learning. But for now, let's just raise your awareness of these key considerations. You have certain elements that exist in your classroom, communication, assessment. We need to make sure that you develop the equivalent experience in your online course. Um, one of the great things with capturing evidence of learning, when you integrate technology, you'll find that you can really enhance the diversity, complexity, and my favorite, efficiency of your assessment. Uh, it, it may really change the way you view assessment completely. Um, but we'll talk more about that in a later module. For now, let's talk more about technology and media, how to integrate it into your course, and how will it support the learning. So integration can depend on your LMS capabilities, but you need to think about will students click and link out to something else, or will it open up directly in their course? 
you want to make sure that all of the technology and media you do integrate is compliant with um, the American Disabilities Act, right? We want students to be able to access the material regardless of any disabilities they might have. And finally, all media is not created equal. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> Catherine's giggling here, but yep. you know, sometimes we confuse visual stimulation with visual cognition or learning and engagement. So don't sacrifice the quality of your pedagogy for the bling. Just because a page <laughs> looks great doesn't mean students are going to learn the language by looking at it, right? Um, so let's talk now, shift a little bit, and think of delivery methods. Catherine mentioned earlier that we talk a little bit about synchronous and asynchronous. So as you think about your course, what elements need to happen at the same time, simultaneously, in a live group together? Those synchronous events, identify those. And then decide, where can those synced events happen? Do they have to happen in the same physical space? Or could they happen outside of that? So if you identify some elements of your course need to happen at the same time in the same physical space, you're headed into the world of blended learning where you have some elements online and some elements face-to-face. -face. But ultimately, whether you blend or go fully online, there's some considerations that can help you think about what might be appropriate for your course. So there are a lot of benefits of synchronous interactions as well as asynchronous interactions. For example, um, asynchronous interactions tend to be a bit more reflective. You might even find that they're more rigorous because students have time to think and process before they respond versus being put on the spot in the classroom environment. Some students prefer the synchronous environment because they like that peer influence, the kind of spontaneity and synergistic energy that comes out of a synchronous event. But for the student who's really uncomfortable in front of a group, the asynchronous environment might be really valuable. It's less intimidating. They can produce their language without feeling like the whole class is watching and judging what they say. So identify which elements of your course work best synchronously versus asynchronously, and then determine which ones need to happen in person. Some things just work better in person, like a group trip to the French restaurant or a theatrical presentation. So webcams can help us decrease the transactional distance between our learners and ourselves, the instructor, but sometimes human interaction is vital. Um, at the same time, sometimes you think something needs to happen in person, and maybe it could happen just as well online. Here are a few examples, what some synchronous and asynchronous events might look like. Now, as you look at this table, you might be wondering, could any of these happen online? And really, all of these could happen online. So, you know, it, it just requires thinking out of the box a little. You can still have group discussions online. You can still have speaking lab online. Um, it doesn't mean that there's never a justification for in-person meetings. And a future module in this program will talk more about tools and resources to help you maximize what the computer does best versus what the human does best. But in the meantime, I think just considering asynchronous and synchronous and kind of breaking down those walls of what we think has to happen in person. Uh, that's a great step toward kind of going into your course development with an open mind. So let's talk a little bit about the creation and use of content in your course. What resources will you use? So maybe you've already developed some stuff. Maybe you use open educational resources or OER. Maybe you rely heavily on publisher content and they have an ebook and you want to build your course out of that. Um, maybe there are apps like Duolingo or Mango or whatever. Um, Creative Commons is great because you know what you can reuse and what attributions or criteria surround reusing that material. Um, but you might also determine that you're going to just start from scratch and author all of your own resources. So that's good too, right? Keep in mind that you want to align. And when I say align your content, it means you've got stated learning outcomes, practice activities, assessments, and those all map to the same learning outcomes, right? 
um, you want to make sure that you follow whatever regulations are in place for accreditation and that you use good design concepts. And you probably saw this coming. There's a future module that will talk about design concepts. <laughs> <laughs> so with all of your content, regardless of whether you use existing resources out there or develop your own, or maybe you tap into professional organizations like Actful has some nice resources. There are lots of listservs that can give you ideas. But regardless of what you're using or creating, ensure that you're in compliance with federal regulations and with your university or your institution policies. So accessibility, copyright, um, making sure you're compliant for financial aid. Are you going to be distance or a correspondence course? Make sure you align with whatever those regulations are from the Higher Ed Act and so forth. That's just a little piece of content creation and use, but let's talk more about learners now. That'll get us going on to another vein here. Wow, we're just rolling through this really fast. Like you said, it's uh, jumping into the pool feet first and swimming <laughs> right away. So learners are the whole reason that we're doing this. We want people to learn foreign languages. We want them to learn them really well. And so we need to consider them as we're considering all the other parameters. Who are these students going to be who are going to be in your online course? And what is their motivation? And in particular, how well prepared are they? We're going to take a look at these questions. So first of all, who are going to be your learners? Are these going to be students from your institution? Um, which students are going to enroll from your institution into your online courses? Ask yourself, why aren't they going to the face-to-face -face courses? What do they expect out of an online course um, that they think they're not going to have to do in a face-to-face -face course? And I can tell you from personal experience, I had a bunch of students who thought there would be no um, synchronous speaking. Well, I do my courses greatly synchronously um, through uh, uh, voice over IP sort of things and they're talking and they're talking together and they're in group work and there's a lot of, of speech production going on. Um, will all the students be online? You can actually, and I'm, I, I don't want to confuse terms of blended here, but you can actually have a face-to-face, -face, and I've done this, where I've had face-to-face -face students at the same time as I've had distance students. The distance students are online, so I really have to think through how they're going to participate, um, what sorts of things they're going to have that I do differently from my face-to-face -face students. That's not something I would <laughs> highly suggest, but it can be done. Um, Outsiders, maybe your students are going to be coming from a general population that, where you've got a contract with government or industry or other schools. How often does it happen that we have a course like an AP course and there aren't enough students in our school, but if you put together two or three other schools, you've got a full AP course and the AP students can all be together in their AP courses. So who are the people who might be from the outside? How are they getting admitted? Do they have the same admission standards as regular face-to-face -face students? And how are they going to get support? How are they going to get technical support? If you don't ever see your students because they're in Afghanistan, which happens with some of our, our friends who are teaching, um, say, at the University of Maryland University College, they've got students all far flung across the, the four corners of the world, how are they going to get technical support if something isn't working? That's got to be figured out. Um, are they going to get learning support? Are there going to be other student services to help them out? Um, what all is available for the learners, particularly the ones who are not on campus, so that they can be supported? Are you going to have a mix of students? Uh, are you going to have on-campus, off-campus, and far-distant learners? Figure out who your, your class is going to be, because how you then structure your synchronous, your asynchronous, your materials, all of that is, has to be factored in. 
So let's take a look at some learner motivations. And these correspond. One kind of goes to one and two to two, but I'm just going to go through first motivations. A lot of learners are motivated to take online courses because they want that anytime, anywhere accessibility. And it is great. That's what we want with online. We want flexibility. Uh, that's the second one, flexible time frames, where yes, you have three hours of instruction a week, for example, but you don't have to do it exactly Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 10 to 11 a.m. Um, the online should be offering some modicum of flexible time frames. The cost, in some instances, it can cost less to learn online, especially with MOOCs, which many of them are free. Um, yeah. There's been a great Spanish MOOC, uh, completely free, and hundreds and hundreds of people have taken it. Learning support. Some learners like the fact that they can get their teacher to repeat and repeat and repeat because they've got a video of the teacher and they can stop the teacher and they can rewind the teacher. Now that doesn't happen so often in a face-to-face -face classroom, but it certainly does happen in the online environment. If you've got videos for your students, if you've got little learning elements, they can go back and look at it. Oh, they can take their time to learn it. It's not going to be, well, I've got 10 minutes to get through this in class, and then we're going to do some work on it. They can spend, if they need, half an hour, an hour. Um, they can look at the videos again. You can have in all kinds of formative quizzing as they're going through. Some of the great things you can do with, uh, with uh, Camtasia, for example, you can have a video where you're talking about something and then immediately they're getting formative quizzes and feedback immediately from how they're performing on the uh, formative quizzing. So some students are also mo motivated because they think there's less accountability in a, an online course. Well, as we go over to the misconceptions, <laughs> we can see First of all, that yes, there's, there's anytime, anywhere accessibility, but time management and learning autonomy is all on the learner. They need to be increasingly autonomous learners. Where there are flexible time frames, yes, but, and again, this goes back to be to the time management and the learning autonomy, the work can't be done an hour before it's due they need to be working and you need to build into the structure of your course things that they have to do over time so that that learning can filter down through so it can get from the short term to the medium to the long term memory. Um, yeah, because trying to get at all of those little homework assignments and the testing done the hour before it's due, that's not good learning. Um, online learning may actually be more costly. And, you know, that's going to depend. It, it certainly, they're going to have to, if they're taking this at home, they're going to have to have good technology. They're going to have to have high-speed internet. Um, as far as learning support, yes, they can rewind us on the videos, um, but there is frequently built into online courses a 24 to 48 hour response time. So they may email us and expect to hear back from us even though they're doing it at one o'clock in the morning, but we're not gonna be responding. Well, some of us will, but others will not be responding at one o'clock in the morning. And as we build into our courses that they do not expect us to respond within 10 minutes. Um, sometimes upwards of 48 hours, uh, it needs to be the standard. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and as far as accountability, uh -uh. exams can be proctored. They can either be proctored face-to-face -face at various institutions, and proctoring can be sent, set up all across the world. Uh, there can be voice over IP exchanges, Skype exchanges, or some other kind of thing where you're actually seeing them so you know that that's the student who is supposed to be responding. Um, 
there, there is a lot of accountability. There should be a lot of accountability. Um, students need to be aware of that. But you also need to be aware that there are some who think there isn't that uh, accountability. Now, learners need to be prepared. Uh, there are some potential learner, learning deficits that our online students are coming to us with. They may be new to online learning, just in general. They may never have taken an online course before, and holy mo Moses, they're taking online language. Whoa. Um, some of them are novices in how to learn a foreign language. This could be their first foreign language. They're, they may not be all that good in all of those ways of being a language learner. Most of them and many of our courses are the first and second year language courses, so they're new to the language that we're teaching them. And keeping in mind, e even in the online venue, we are trying still to have predominantly 80, 90, 95 percent in target language. Yikes. Um, and to do this online means we really have to think a lot of things through and give a lot of support and recognize that they're maybe not used to hearing this much of the target language. They're new to it. And some of them just are not that good in language skills. You know, uh, moving from high school levels on into college levels, a lot of our students don't have the greatest learning skills. And that's part of what we're giving them as the instruction. So. The other th uh, second part of this, the learners may not be motivated to learn the language. Some, for some of these students, this is a requirement. They don't think they want to learn a language. Uh, we need to work with them to help, if at all possible, find a way to motivate them. And that could be a little bit harder sometimes in the distance venue. Third one, learners may not always have the full spectrum of the communicational channels that the face-to-face -face cl class offers. In a face-to-face -face class, I see immediately when a student frowns. I see immediately when students start doing something that's not on task. Um, I also note that there are so many channels of communication when we're face-to-face. -face. There's smell, there's sight, there's sound. And yes, we do have sight and sound, but it's mediated by a screen. So the other thing is that students in a face-to-face -face class have an immediate community of learning. They're there with other students. There's peer pressure. There's, there's peer help. Um, we need to be particularly uh, conscious of building a community of learning and practice around our students. And finally, a lot of learners don't recognize that they've got these deficits and they don't know how to surmount them. We have to build that into our courses to help them recognize when, when a deficit is hurting their learning and to give them strategies and better ways of becoming more and more autonomous learners. So. Guys, yeah, I don't know if you feel like you're drinking from the fire hose, but you are, okay? <laughs> so we, we just produced a lot of information. Um, like we've mentioned multiple times, future modules unpack this. And um, hopefully this is just a nice overview to get you thinking about some key concepts that you might wanna dig deeper on. Now the deep, dig deeper of this section, of this module should be useful because it'll provide you some further resources. So links to um, articles, if you're interested in formal education and becoming an online educator, uh, some resources for that. Uh, we've also plugged in some universities that are doing languages online. So you can reach out to them and um, observe their courses, touch base with them and learn what kinds of things they've learned through experience. And of course, you have your mentor who goes with you through this program and the distance learning special interest group. We are a community and we are here for support, encouragement. We wanna help you enjoy your journey. 
Thanks for the chance. Catherine, this has been fun, hasn't it? Oh, it really has been fun because this is online learning. What you're doing right here with us, this is what it is. And uh, hopefully you feel like we're starting to build a, a community with you, that uh, the distance learning SIG is with the mentoring program and just as practitioners that you know that we do have a community and there are a lot of people with a lot of really good knowledge deep knowledge and good practices and we're all here sharing and caring so thanks for coming with us for this uh, everything you wanted to know about <laughs> online language teaching and learning in under 25 minutes <laughs> thanks Jennifer this has been great